I thought I'd start out today by talking about how we interpret paradise laws. And of course, this has been a question that has uh, kind of been asked through the centuries. And there are probably many, many ways to do that. Of course, there have been many ways to do that. So we can look at, for example, the historical context. So what was happening in Milton's time and, and his culture and, and see how that would impact the text. Also, we can look at things like power relations. Um, Marxism has uh, had a lot of influence on some, some theorists. And we can also take a look at religious texts or Bible studies or the psychological aspects of the text. Um, of course, we always ask the question about whether the author, what the author intended and what that means for the text. And also, uh, we have another idea of the audience response or the reader's response. Uh, so when you come to a text, uh, what, what kind of thing do you see? What, what does your personal background uh, help you understand when you read? We also uh, have things like literary conventions. So how, how, do, how does the imagery in the poem function to help us understand the poem? And so there have been many different ways to read the poem. Um, one of the ways that I think is an effective way to read it is to look at other things that the author has written and then to notice the big themes and then to sort of apply those themes to the text that you're questioning. And so that's what we're going to try to do today. But we are also going to look at a very interesting person. Uh, his name is Stanley Fish. And he is um, very, very much a prominent Milton scholar in America today. Uh, he's, if he's not the foremost, he's close. Uh, he does a lot of other things, too. He's a literary critic. Um, and he's a, a columnist, but he, um, he's a Miltonist. I think that's where his passion is. So uh, one of the best ways to start interpreting a text is to start with what we know. And of course, uh, we already mentioned the historical circumstances of the time. And I had mentioned this uh, last time as well, so uh, you can try to, try to um, uh, understand that if you look at the handouts that I had from last time that uh, the English Civil War was going on and Milton was very involved in the Civil War in many different ways. Um, he worked directly with Oliver Cromwell. And so he was, and he was also the voice of the nation, the poet voice of the nation at the time. So he was very involved in the Civil War and uh, everything that was happening. Of course, the Civil War was dealing with two religious factions, um, and it was basically over the idea of the divine right of kings. So it was king, the king versus parliament, and then the king had uh, followers from the Episcopalian tradition, and the parliament had followers from more of the Puritan or uh, Presbyterian tradition. But that's kind of oversimplifying it to a certain extent. There were class issues as well. But, but these were some of the things that were happening during the time. So uh, when we look at Paradise Lost, we can actually read Paradise Lost as a, a way to connect with what was happening with the Civil War. And Milton very much wrote into Paradise Lost his vision of what happened. And, and uh, so he uses the fall of man's story to, to discuss historical circumstances. Uh, the biography of Milton is also important because uh, a lot of times an author will insert personal personal things that happen to them, crises, um, spiritual crises, or, or maybe personal things, uh, personal circumstances. Uh, one, of, one of the things, that, a couple things that happened to Milton was that he lost, his, he lost two of his wives and two children. And so uh, do you see any kind of sense of despair over loss of, of you know, death themes, that kind of thing? And so we can take a look at it from that angle as well. Um, but then we can also look at the themes in other works. And so looking at the, the big themes that appear across uh, Milton's works, we see things like trials of virtue, triumph of faith, interaction between heaven and earth, and of course he is also very interested in death and afterlife. Okay. My, t my subtitle today is How Satan Works. And that uh, title is taken from Stanley Fish's book that's called How Milton Works. It's his uh, latest work, I believe, on Milton. And it sort of summarizes a lifetime of his scholarly study of Milton. And so Stanley Fish is going to essentially posit that Milton works from the inside out, meaning that instead of uh, sort of an empirical 
kind of point of view where you would go around and gather evidence first and then uh, let that evidence lead you to a conclusion. Milton does the opposite of that. He starts with the overall conclusion and then lets the events lead up to the conclusion. And there's always this idea of, of an inner principle that people of God stand for in Milton. And so, and so uh, that's sort of the premise uh, Stanley Fish uses. But I'd like to just read a few things that he says uh, to get an idea of how he has seen Milton working. He says, Milton criticism sometimes offers us a choice between an, absolute, sorry, an absolutist poet with a focused vision and a single overriding message, and a more tentative provisional poet alert to the ambiguities and dilemmas of the moral life. So he's either, uh, usually they see him either as being, oh, it's, it's very dogmatic, it's very, this is the right way, or no, we can, there might be some shades of gray, basically. Um, so, but he says the truth is that Milton is both, and he is so without either contradiction or tension. So that's his, um, that's his main statement and how Milton works. So it comes down again to this inner principle uh, that people of God hold to. And uh, Stanley Fish continues, he says, he never wavers in his conviction that obedience to God is the prime and trumping value in every situation. But because in his antinomian theology, the roadway of obedience is an internal one, not available to external confirmation or disconfirmation, the taking of any path is fraught with danger that it may be self-aggrandizement rather than the path of faith. In the midst of resolving to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, and well, with all, sorry, that was thy might, you could end up embracing and enacting a form of self-love you think to have renounced. You might fool yourself into thinking, I, I really have renounced it, but maybe you haven't. By freeing you from the external constraints, the doctrine of Christian liberty delivers you to a freedom whose exercise puts you on a high wire without a safety net. So that's kind of the danger that we see in um, sort of the idea that you presume that you have, you have this new nature and then you, you sort of overstep your bounds with that. Okay, so I'd like to start with uh, a midlife sonnet to show us how a poem from Milton's uh, earlier uh, writing life can help us interpret Paradise Lost. Now, this is one of my favorite sonnets of Milton because this is where we see him inserting something from his personal life into a poem. As you know, Milton went blind when he was about 43 years old, and uh, as a result of that, uh, he had to reconsider his profession. I mean, could he really be a poet uh, if he was blind? How do you do that? And so he struggled with that, and he, he didn't know exactly how to accomplish that, but he did figure it out, obviously. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days, in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, referring back to the, the parable of you know, the, the three talents, or the three men that receive the talents. So if death to hide your talents. His talent he's referring to here is writing, his writing talent. Lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve there with my maker, and present my true account, lest he returning chide. Doth God exact day labor, light denied? I finally ask. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke? They serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. And the standing and waiting part is going to be what figures into uh, our study today. Uh, Stanley Fish believes that this idea of standing and waiting is a central theme to Milton work. I'll just tell you briefly about another source that has helped us in interpreting Milton's work. Until uh, about 150 years after Milton died, uh, nobody could find this book. We knew about it because Milton had hinted at it in, uh, in his commonplace book. Commonplace books were, were used kind of like diaries and journals are used today, and people would just sort of write down their thoughts, personal thoughts, and whatever they were working on at the time, maybe. And so there was this, there was this uh, passage in, in, on one page about this treatise that he had worked on, 
and it was basically the Christian doctrine, the, the entire Christian doctrine. So, but nobody could, nobody knew where it was until 1823, and uh, somebody was going through uh, papers in London's old state paper office, and they came across it. Um, his name was Robert Lemon, and he was very excited. He understood its value as soon as he saw it. Uh, there has been a little bit of, of uh, questioning about whether it's really Milton's work or not, but that, that questioning has sort of been overruled by uh, sort of prominent scholars that have shown almost without a doubt that it was Milton. But what this tells us is, is essentially how we can start to interpret Paradise Lost, because it gives us the Christian doctrine systematically. And what was different about this, this uh, particular document compared to other Christian doctrines at the time was that Milton used primarily scripture to argue his points, uh, whereas other, other writers might use tradition or something like this. But Milton believed that you know, the scripture could defend itself. And so he used that. Uh, to, to defend his points of view. One of the things that might be interesting to this audience is that one of the uh, doctrines in, in this work is that of mortalism. Milton was a mortalist. He believed that the soul died, and he believed the soul and the body were one. So that's, uh, that was um, interesting to me when I read it, coming from an Adventist perspective, and that there was a group of people at Milton's time who, who believed this. It was a small group. Um, one of the reasons why the document was hidden for so long is because the government had taken it when they discovered uh, what it was. Uh, essentially, one of the scholars who tried to publish it got, um, was caught by the authorities and they, they took the document and hid it. And so it, it was gone for a while. Uh, but um, the, the, the most important thing about this document is that we can use it to try to interpret Paradise Lost. And we start to see what Milton is really thinking. Of course, he wouldn't have been able to publish it during his time, having been captured and put in prison for his, you know, for his part in the Civil War. He would not have been able to just publish freely his beliefs because they were considered unorthodox. So this is what happens. This is what the, the book uh, revealed. I said many interesting doctrines, but what I should have said was heresies, <laughs> because uh, some of the things that he, that he revealed in this document were heretical to the established church. So for example, he was anti-Trinitarian. Did, Milton didn't see any evidence in the, in the Bible um, that the uh, third person, we usually say the third person of the Trinity, um, was co-equal with God. And so that's what he means when he says anti-Trinitarian. Uh, so that, of course, would have been against the, the doctrines of the established church of England. Uh, but the doctrine that we're most interested in today is that of the principle of regeneration. And this is the idea that God, and I'm simplifying it here because, uh, you know, this is, it's, he devotes probably at least two chapters to it, and he says a lot about it. But just to simplify it, the idea that God's spirit works on the heart to renew it once somebody accepts God into their life. And so that changes their inner compass point, it changes their focus, and as a result of that, they can start to obey God freely. So um, Stanley Fish is going to point out that standing according to this principle is, a, is an important piece of Paradise Lost. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly the motif of the choir. Milton writes a lot about the choirs. Um, the heavenly choirs, mostly. And so what does the choir represent? Well, on earth, the choir can represent two things at once in a certain sense. Um, it's a paradox. We have this uh, idea of the, the person singing along with the choir. So that kind of represents this idea that humans want to fit in with everybody at the same time that they want to stand out because you have people who, while they're singing in the choir, they might want to do a solo, or they might want their voice to be louder than everybody else's around them, or hear their own voice while they're in the choir. The thing about the choir is that you can hear your own voice and still remain with the choir. And so this, this it's sort of a representing, it's, the choir is representing a, a paradox. And that's how Stanley Fish reads uh, 
reads Milton's work, he's going to see Milton himself as wanting to stand out from the choir at times and then wanting to fade back into the choir at times. So there's this paradox and it operates with Milton as we go through the text. And this, of course, is related to the temptation because, and back to what we read before, if you have a lot of self-love, you'll want to glorify yourself. If you have a lot of God's love, you'll want to glorify God. So it seems like staying in the choir is um, a better idea for the Christian. But poets throughout time have had to deal with this idea of, well, should I really be trying to glorify myself in, in writing this big poem? And Milton was concerned about it. He grappled with that. Uh, with that idea, with wanting to immortalize himself by writing this great, grand, thematic poem, and at the same time, uh, wanting to, at the same time to to hold back and glorify God. So how does that work? Okay, so uh, we're going to look at an, another early poem by Milton called "At a Solemn Music," and that was written in 1645. It was when he was about in his middle years of life, just maybe on the younger side of that. And uh, what he's going to do is show us two, two parts of a choir, or you could say two choirs. I'm not sure which one we should say, but the first half of the poem deals with heaven's choir. And it almost gives us a future point of view. The second half of the poem deals with earth, earth's choir. And so one of the questions I wanna ask you is, how, how are the two relating to each other in this poem? So the first part of the poem, at a solemn music, I'll just read through it quickly uh, to give us a sense of what's going on. I'll try to highlight the, the words that I'm most interested in. Blessed pair of sirens, pledges of heaven's joy, sphere-born, harmonious sisters, voice and verse, wed your divine sounds and mix power employ, dead things with inbreathed sense able to pierce, and to our high-raised fantasy present that undisturbed song of pure consent. I sung before the sapphire, uh, sa sorry, sapphire colored throne to him that sits thereon with saintly shout and solemn jubilee where the bright seraphim in burning row their loud uplifted angel trumpets blow and the cherubic host in thousand choirs touch their immortal harps of golden wires with those just spirits that wear victorious palms hymns devout and holy psalms singing everlastingly. Does this sound like a heaven's choir? this idea that there are maybe um, road people standing around with, with their trumpets and there's music and there's seraphim and there are cherubs. By the way, the word cherubic, that is a Miltonism. He took a word and he made it into an adjective. He brought it into the language that way. Um, Hymns he vowed in holy psalms singing everlastingly. This idea of, of spirits that are singing everlastingly. So this harkens back to uh, text in Revelation 7. And I have some people helping me read today. We're going to go through a couple of passages in Revelation 7 to show how Milton can bring in a Bible text um, and, and show the significance of that. So again, the passage that, that we're taking from Milton is, with those just spirits that wear victorious palms, hymns devout and holy psalms, singing everlastingly. And uh, this comes from Revelation 7, 9, and then we'll keep going through through Revelation 7. A great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice. So Milton is alluding here to Revelation 7 in his text. Now I did highlight that word stood because that, that word is going to keep coming back to us. Okay, so we'll start with the narrator. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, All of us together, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Who are these clothed in pure robes, and from where have they come? Sir, you know. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. The idea of a shepherd guiding somebody's heart is, again, 
part of this idea of standing, standing according to the principle within. And so that's why I highlighted those two parts um, there before the throne of God. And you see here, we're kind of jumping ahead to the future um, and this idea that we're, when the saints are already with God, right? Um, but we also have what we, um, I'll, I'll pause on that thought for a moment. Um, Though the servants of God in this picture are not taking action, they are performing the service of standing. This is the idea. Um, they're always ready to act. And that in and of itself is service to Milton. So uh, they also serve who only stand and wait. So according to Fish, they are capable of performing services which they are not now performing, although in being so capable, so ready, they are in fact performing all the time. To be sure, it may be the case on some later occasion that they will be called to a specific action. So this idea of uh, always standing, being ready for God, and being true to that, that godly principle. So how does the earthly choir respond to the heavenly choir? And uh, time gets very funny here. That we on earth with undiscording voice may rightly answer that melodious noise as once we did, till disproportion sin jarred against nature's chime, and with harsh din broke the fair music that all creatures made to their great Lord, whose love their motions swayed in perfect diapason, whilst they stood in first obedience and their state of good. May we soon again renew that song and keep in tune with heaven, till God ere long to his celestial consort us unite to live with him and sing an endless morn of light. The idea of consort there indicates the bridegroom uh, ready for his bride. Uh, the word uh, diapason is interesting here. Uh, I just wanted you to, just, I wanted to show you how Milton plays with language and uh, how, how he uses words that just so perfectly represent what he's trying to do in a passage. The meaning of diapason is a rich, full outpouring of melodious sound. That's sort of the first meaning. But then there's another meaning where it, it sort of includes the whole choir, the whole octave, everybody's voice together. And there's also this idea of the two coming, coming together and um, somebody who has the right to go first but giving yield or sway to somebody else. So there's a lot of ideas here in just one word, but I'm, I'm framing it here so that we can discuss the, how the two choirs are relating to each other. We're going to jump into Paradise Lost for just a moment uh, before we come back to it. Uh, but this is just to show uh, something that Stanley Fish is saying again. So Adam says to Eve in Paradise Lost, this one moment, they're actually, um, the, the setting is they, they're sort of uh, lying out on the ground and they're looking up at the stars. And so um, Adam says to Eve, how often from the steep of echoing hill or thicket have we heard celestial voices to the midnight air, soul or responsive each to others note, singing their great creator. Okay, so, and the word there is spelled correctly in Milton's text. I, I put it there so that we'll see it later. And um, here we have uh, the, the idea of the celestial voices again. There's an idea, there's an idea here that we're all part of one big choir and the choir is always singing. And so the celestial voices, it harkens back to that idea of the music of the spheres where there's harmony between heaven and earth. And uh, that was an idea that uh, was held in the Middle Ages. And the, um, this is what Stanley Fish says about that. The song has only one note, a note that has been sounding long before any particular singer takes it up. It doesn't matter, therefore, whether the singer is soul or responsive, each to other's note, for the song is always corporately sung, even when the singer is apparently single. And since this is a song that everyone sings, it is a song that no one sings. And moreover, it is a song sung to no one, since there isn't anyone not already singing it, including God. In the ordinary sense of communication, the speaker offers listeners something, a message, insight, pleasure, that they do not yet have, but this is a scene not of communication, of distance between parties in different zones of understanding, but of responsiveness, of voices answering one another in conformity 
with a harmony that is already achieved. So when you're born into the world, you just add your voice to the harmony that's already going on. Nor can it be said that everyone is singing to God as if he were a spectator and separate from the song. He is the song, its content and its source. They are all singing their creator, not singing about their creator, but singing, breathing, uttering, and therefore ceaselessly replicating him. Now, I chose this passage because I wanted you to see the difference between communication and responsiveness. There, there are some maybe subtle differences uh, between those two words. Communication indicates distance. Responsiveness indicates that, that in a certain sense there is no distance. There's a sort of oneness and the hearts can speak to hearts. So I'm going to show, I hope, that uh, Satan is going to use communication and that God is going to use responsiveness um, as, as a way of interacting with people. Um, so again, uh, just kind of repeating what I said, the continuous celestial song represents the harmony between heaven and earth, the love emanating uh, from God that causes the choir to sway. So there is a sense in which there's a dance going on between the heavenly choir and the earthly choir, that uh, whatever happens with the heavenly choir also happens with the earthly choir, as long as they're in tune. Okay, so uh, we know from the poem, it said that at some point there was a jarring that happened. And so Milton is very interested in how that happened. How did the jarring happen? Because we were at one time in full accord together. We were responsive to the heavenly choir, but now, uh, but now it's not so. So how did that happen? And Milton's going to attempt to answer that in, in Paradise Lost. Okay, so again, um, God's movement, uh, the way that Milton presents God's movement um, or action, is inwardly directed. It's an unforced heart responsiveness uh, dealing with the inner principle of reason controlling free will. In fact, Milton goes as far as, as to even posit that uh, the will is free when reason is controlling it, only when reason is controlling it. Uh, and, and as far as God goes, his subjects stand and wait in a position of readiness to do his bidding. And also there's a sense of, of singing along with the choir and not trying to stand out from it or try to, trying to jar against it. Whereas Satan's movements are outwardly directed, uh, he has to use persuasive rhetoric to try to get what he wants. And he also has to uh, show outwardly uh, his, his, um, his, whatever he's doing has to ha happen outside of us, not inside. So uh, he's, try he's aiming for the inside, but he's doing everything outside. So uh, he's, he's more through the show of passion uh, rather than reason. And his subjects stand out. They try to stand out away from the choir. And they physically act and move and reach, writhe, I said, or slither along, because we're going to see the serpent in this role, of course. And it's usually in a position of temptation to an outer enticement or to that of actually being possessed. So, of course, in the story, the, the serpent is possessed by Satan. Okay, I wanted to show the slide again because I hadn't referred to the last character in the story. Did you know that you were a part of Paradise Lost? Did you know that Milton inscribed you into the text? He did. Um, Milton inscribed you, and the, and the reason we know that is because Milton keeps referring to you in the text. Milton himself, uh, Milton inscribed himself into the text, and he will keep appearing uh, over and over in, into the text. Uh, by the way, Satan, although the, the word Satan is used in Paradise Lost, but oftentimes Milton is using an epithet for Satan, another word for him like the tempter or the archfiend. So the reason we know that we're in the text is, is because of what Milton does in the text as we're reading it. Uh, he does something called, uh, well, I'm calling it surfacing, where, where suddenly, without ex expecting it, Milton's voice comes back into the, into the narrative. And he'll sort of show you that he's been there along with you the whole time telling you the story. So there's a funny thing that happens with time. We suddenly realize that we're still sitting there with Milton to a certain extent. And at the same time, we're trying to get into the story, which is a historical um, event. So we try to get into the story, but then Milton sort of keeps calling us back to the real time. And what is he doing here? Is he jarring against the choir, uh, so to speak? 
is he trying to show us uh, what he can do. Uh, he wants us to know somehow that we have been in conversation and that he's always the storyteller. And he, I think, as, aside from that, of course, he's interested in, in being a great poet as well. Uh, he wants us to know that we're connected to God and to each other, that we already know how the story goes. He keeps reminding us, remember, and he'll sort of give us a, 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 a foretaste of what's coming before it happens, because we already know we're part of the fallen race. And, and he wants to keep reminding us that that's, that's who we are. And because of that, we are also susceptible to temptations. Uh, but we still also, um, though, though we're fallen, we also have the freedom to choose. And that, of course, is very central to Milton's theology, is the freedom to choose. And also that our power choice lies in the reason governed will again. So um, we're going to start just by looking at how Satan works in the text. And the subheadings, hopefully, will give you a sense of what Satan is doing as we go through the 17th century text. Uh, OK, so this is when he's just starting to have his plan. And what he's going to do is he's going to become a mist. He's going to rise in the middle of the garden from the fountain as a mist. So he's transforming himself into this mist. And it's really quite humorous because Milton has Satan travel through the Garden of Eden as a mist. And then uh, there's a sad part because as he's traveling through Eden, he starts to lament his choices again. Uh, his choice to rebel because he sees the beauty and he wishes that he could be walking in Eden to enjoy the beauty instead of having all these plotting thoughts against the people that live there. Okay, so um, he's already thinking here about what he's going to do. He's going to create himself as a mist, recreate himself as a mist, and then he's going to enter a serpent because he's noticed how subtle the serpents are in the garden. And I love the, the last line here, where Hap may find the serpent sleeping in whose mazy folds to hide me and the dark intent I bring. Mazy folds, isn't that a great uh, phrase? So um, Satan's dilemma at this point is that he's a strong, beautiful angel, and now he's going to descend all the way down to entering into a beast. Oh, foul descent that I, who erst contended with gods to sit the highest, am now constrained into a beast and mixed with bestial slime. This essence to incarnate and imbrute, isn't that a great word, imbrute? Satan is going to be imbruted. That to the height of deity aspired. So here you have, again, a sense of the past, Satan's memory, his memory of his rebellion, his revolt. So saying, through each thicket, dank or dry, like a, bl a black mist, low creeping, he held on his midnight search, for as soon as he might find the serpent, him fast sleeping soon he found, in labyrinth of many a round self rolled, his head the mist, uh, the mist, well stored with subtle wiles. I love that, well stored with subtle wiles. <laughs> Not yet in horrid shade or dismal den, nor no scent yet, but on the grassy herb, fearless, unfeared, he slept. In at his mouth the devil entered, and his brutal sense in heart of head, possessing soon inspired with act intelligential, but his sleep disturbed not, waiting close the approach of morn. So the serpent is sleeping. Now we don't actually have this extra piece of information in the Bible, right? We don't know exactly how this happened. We suddenly have in chapter 3 of Genesis, the serpent starts speaking. So. Milton is using his imagination, probably, and a little bit of tradition. I did find out this week that Milton had read Origen because uh, he mentions Origen in his work De, Do De Doctrina. So we know that he did have access to Origen's works and he was reading Origen. So it could have been, maybe, he got the idea from, from that. So this idea that uh, somehow the this, this serpent was possessed. And that word nocent will come back. Um, it's the opposite of innocent, of course. So uh, meaning guilty or sinful or harmful. So uh, he, has, he has now entered the serpent. He has waited till morning. And he has now seen Eve. Uh, and he's wondering how to get her attention. And so this is, again, the subtitle meaning how Satan works. 
So we're, we're sort of extracting that from this text. So he's looking at her and he's kind of behind the bushes and he's weeding back and forth a little bit. He's hiding himself and then he, and then he exposes himself and then he hides again, now hid, now seen. Nearer he drew and many a walk traverse of stateliest covert, cedar, pine, or palm, then voluble and bold, now hid, now seen among thick woven arborets and flowers embroidered on each bank, then he sees the hand of Eve. Such pleasure took the serpent to behold, this flowery plat, the sweet recess of Eve, thus early, thus alone, her heavenly form angelic, but more soft and feminine, her graceful innocence, her every air of gesture or least action overawed his malice, and with repine sweet bereaved his fierceness of the fierce intent it brought. That space the evil one abstracted, stood from his own evil, and for the time remained stupidly good, of enmity, disarmed, of guile, of hate, of envy, or revenge. So just for one moment, he hesitates. And again, we see the struggle inside of him. And this is one reason why the reader can sympathize with Satan to a degree in Paradise Lost, is because Satan has a very human uh, struggle inside of him. And he's, he's grappling with what he, whether he should really carry out his plan, uh, seeing her beauty. And in another place in the text, he actually says to both Adam and Eve uh, in his own heart, he says, I would have loved you. I, I, I know I would have loved you if, if I hadn't done what I did. So he's here, uh, just pausing for one moment, notice that it says he stood from his own evil. Again, this idea of standing um, instead of going forward and, and uh, committing what his plan is. But, but the hot hell, which always in him burns, though in mid-heaven, soon ended his delight, and tortures him now more, the more he sees a pleasure not for him ordained. Then soon fierce hate he recollects, and all his thoughts of mischief, gratulating, thus excites. That word gratulating, uh, hanging on to it, nurturing your hatred. And so he he's allows that to come back and consume him. Okay, another way, another way that Satan comes. So buried he, and of his torturous train, curled many a wanton wreath in sight of Eve, to lure her eye. She busied, heard the sound of rustling leaves, but minded not, as used to such disport before her through the field, from every beast, more duteous at her call, than at Circean call the herd disguised. There's our classical reference again. He bolder now, uncalled before her stood, but as in gaze admiring of the bowed his turret crest and sleek enameled neck, fawning and licked the ground whereon she trod. So here we see Satan as seducer in a certain sense. We see Satan, uh, or, or the serpent, trying to, uh, to flatter her, right? And, and this is another way that Satan works in the text. And also, as Milton wants to point out, a way that he works with each one of us. So he starts out by a subtle kind of play and flattery around her feet. And so he's trying to get her attention at this point. His gentle, dumb expression turned at length the eye of Eve to mark his play. He, glad of her attention gained, with serpent tongue, organic or impulsive vocal air, his fraudulent temptation now began. He's giving us a sense of what's going to happen. Wonder not, sovereign mistress, if perhaps thou canst to our soul wonder, much less arm thy looks, the heaven of mildness, with disdain, displeased that I approach thee thus, and gaze insatiate, I thus single, nor have feared thy awful brow, more awful thus retired, fairest resemblance of thy maker fair, thee all living things gaze on, all things thine by gift, and thy celestial beauty adore with ravishment beheld, there best beheld were universally admired, but here, in this enclosure wild, these beasts among, beholders rude and shallow to discern half of half what in thee is fair, one man except who sees thee. And what is one? Who shouldst be seen a goddess among gods, adored and served by angels numberless, thy daily train? 
He's asking her, why should you just be here? You're the goddess of the universe. You should be admired by everybody. That's him. That's the serpent speaking for the first time. This is one of my favorite words. <laughs> so glows the tempter. That word glows is very important. Uh, it's another one of these uh, words that Milton is using very intentionally. First of all, it, doesn't it sound great? So glows. <laughs> And so you get a sense that he's flattering. The word glows is related to the word gloss, which is sort of giving an explanation for something or giving more information about something. So it's related to the tongue, so it has to do with what he's saying. But the word glows also refers to gazing at somebody. And so in that word, Milton has tied the two things that, he, that, that, that the serpent is doing together. He's gazing at her in admiration, and he's smooth-talking at the same time. Um, and so uh, then Eve responds to him. At length, not unamazed, she thus in answer spake, What may this mean? Language of man pronounced by tongue of brute, and human sense expressed? The first at least of these I thought denied to beasts, whom God on their creation day created mute to all articulate sound. The latter I demur. For in their looks, much reason, and in their action oft appears. So she's saying, I often thought maybe animals could speak, or maybe they should speak, because they look so intelligent. They look like they're going to speak at times. But I didn't know that they were given speech. Much reason, and in their action oft appears. The serpent, subtlest beast of all the field, I knew, but not with human voice endued, Redouble this miracle, and say, How camest thou speakable of mute, and how to me so friendly grown above the rest of brutal kind, that daily are in sight? Say, for such wonder claims attention due. So he definitely has her attention at this point. It almost seems to be more about uh, the fact that he's speaking than it is about the flattery. Uh, okay, so then he's going to answer back. To whom the guileful tempter thus replied, Empress of this fair world, resplendent Eve, easy to me it is to tell thee all what thou uh, commandst, sorry, it's supposed to be what thou commandst, and right thou shouldst be obeyed. I was at first as other beasts that graze the trodden herb, of abject thoughts and low, as was my food, nor aught but food discerned or sex, and apprehended nothing high. Till on a day roving the field, I chanced a goodly tree far distant to behold, loaded with fruit of fairest colors mixed, ruddy and gold. I nearer drew to gaze, when from the boughs a savory odor blown, grateful to appetite, more pleased my sense than smell of sweetest fennel. Apparently, uh, the 17th century conception of snakes was that their favorite food was fennel. I guess it was fennel and honey. So now say, or the serpent is going to try to uh, expose the tree as being to blame for this. So he's going to first of all blame the tree for, for tempting him to eat the fruit. And then later on, we're going to see him actually worshiping the tree. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, foreshadowing of, of what will happen. Uh, and so he's, he's giving his explanation here. And I probably won't read all the way through this slide, but maybe just a couple of, of lines. Um, so I turned my thoughts and with capacious mind considered all things visible in heaven or earth. This is what happens right after he eats the fruit. He suddenly, his mind is opened and he's able to speak as men speak. So he's lifted to a higher realm. Of course, this is also extra, extra text to the Bible because in the Bible we don't see the full explanation, right? We, we kind of, there's a hint there that that um, if you see a brute speaking, if you see a serpent speaking, then and, and you realize you're connecting with the fruit, uh, that 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 that's, that means something. But um, but uh, but that's actually not in the text. We we sort of re refer that from reading it. Okay. So another way that Satan uh, works is to try to catch somebody unwary. So talk the, the spirited, 
The spirited sly snake and Eve yet more amazed, unwary, thus replied, Serpent, thy overpraising leaves in doubt the virtue of that fruit in thee first proved. But say, but say, where grows that tree? From hence how far? So then he takes her to the tree. To whom the wily adder, blithe and glad, Empress, the way is ready and not long. Beyond a row of myrtles on a flat, fast by a fountain, one small thicket past, a blowing myrrh and balm. If thou accept my conduct, I can bring thee thither soon. Okay, so here uh, the serpent is very polite to her, and he acts that way all the way through their discourse. Another way that Satan works is to make the intricate seem straight. The intricate is uh, a word that means in 17th century language, the crooked, right? You could say it could mean the crooked. Lead then, said Eve. He leading swiftly rolled in tangles and made intricate seem straight to mischief swift. Hope elevates and joy brightens his crest as when a wandering fire compact of unctuous vapor, which the night condenses and the cold environs round, kindled through agitation to a flame, which oft, they say, some evil spirit attends, hovering and blazing with delusive light. Misleads the amazed night wander from his way to bogs and mires and off through pond or pool, there swallowed up and lost from succor far, so glistered the dire snake, and into fraud led Eve, our credulous mother, to the tree of prohibition, root of all our woe. Our woe. So glistered, uh, another verb that Milton is using to show how Satan works with people. What do you think that glistered means? <laughs> okay. Uh, at first, Eve, uh, she, she resists. She says, um, no, uh, we, we could have stopped, we could have spared ourselves coming here. And uh, she explains why. And then she says this, and this is really central to the idea of freedom again. But of this tree we may not taste or touch, God so commanded, and left that command, sole daughter of his voice, the rest we live law to ourselves, our reason is our law. Again, this idea that God has implanted this um, in the, in the regenerate heart, the reason uh, t that um, will govern everything else. And because of that, they can freely choose. And this harkens us back to an earlier conversation between Adam and Eve, where Adam gives Eve a warning before she goes off uh, without him. And, and he said to her, but God left free the will, for what obeys reason is free, and reason he made right, but bid her well aware, and still erect, lest by some fair appearing good surprise she dictate false, and misinform the will to do what God expressly hath forbid. He says, even though reason is a good thing to have, and it can uh, guide us, sometimes it can be deceived. And so uh, watch that it, you're not deceived by that. Okay, so another way that Satan works, again, Satan is moving. He's using outside forces, and he's moving. Um, so here it says, he puts on a new part, and as to passion moved, fluctuates, disturbed, yet comely, and in act raised, as of some great matter to begin. Here he's composing himself to give another speech. He kind of rises up, and he's breathing around, and he's moving. He's doing a lot of movements to get her attention again. And then he turns to the tree and gives this very indirect address. And I, I see here what, what, he's, what he's doing. When he turns to the tree, he's, in essence, doing false worship because he's not really worshiping the tree. He just wants Eve to think that he's worshiping the tree. O oh, sacred, wise, and wisdom-giving plant, mother of science, now I feel thy power within me clear. So he turns to the tree. Now, interestingly enough, we won't get to that part, but Eve does the same thing. As soon as she takes the fruit, she also turns to the tree and addresses the tree and worships the tree. So it's, it's interesting that, that she's doing what he's doing. Then he turns back to Eve and, and tells, explains to her why she doesn't need to believe what she's heard about the tree, um, the, the tasting and touching the tree. Queen of this universe, do not believe those rigid threats of death. Ye shall not die. How should ye? By the fruit, it gives you life to knowledge. By the threatener, here he starts to, to, to stop using the word God and to start using epithets for God. And so he starts by using the word threatener. And of course, this is supposed to uh, start to get Eve thinking that maybe God is not the good person that she thought he was. So uh, he does the indirect address and then he lies. 
here's another way that Satan works. I won't read this passage, but here he's going to start with one argument, and then he's going to twist it. And so, uh, and so ev eventually Eve will, will start to think more about eating the fruit. Uh, deterred not from achieving what might lead to happier life, knowledge of good and evil. Of good, how just? Well, why not learn about good, right? We, we all need to know about good. Of evil, well, if we know evil better, then we can avoid it, right? So uh, that's his twisted argument. He also works by mis mixing in the truth and appealing to reason and desire, even if his argument is false. And he's basically trying to flatter her again or, or, or appeal to her by showing her how she'll be like God because he ate the fruit and now he's like a human. So she'll rise in proportion to that. And uh, the, the, um, one of the last slides I have here, uh, redefining, he redefines the consequence that ye should be as God, since I as man, eternal man, is but proportion meet. I of brute human, ye of human gods. So ye shall die, perhaps, by putting off human to put on gods. Death be wished. Why don't you wish for death then? So that you'll be like a god. Um, and so, um, again, that, that argument is carried through. I'm going to just sort of skip down to the end here. Um, what, what happens in Paradise Lost is Satan will start out by, by sort of giving Eve the idea that God is envious, and then he actually re reverses his argument at the end of his discourse. So at the end, he's actually saying, um, how, how could it be that God could be envious? Uh, can envy dwell in heavenly breasts? So he reverses his argument all the way through, and if you're if you're wise enough as you're going through the discourse, you can see that reversal happening. Uh, but of course, by then, Eve has already been charmed and flattered, and she, she's had all these uh, ideas about rising to God's status, and so she's probably not really listening at this point. And so he, again, his last words to her when he's trying to make this appeal, in heavenly breasts, okay, these, these, and many more causes import your needs of this fair fruit, now she needs it. He's moved all the way down to, well, why not take it to, now she actually needs it. He's tried to prove that to her. God is humane. Reach then and freely taste. His last, um, his last request to her is asking her to move. And so what does that come back to? Well, this idea that if Satan wants us to do something, he has to ask us to make a move to do that. He works from the outside of us, not having um, full access to the inside of the mind, um, and, unless we give him permission to do so. Um, but for God, it, the way God works with us is, is in that responsiveness that the heart gives. And so it's, it's more like heart speak or heart talk. Uh, I just ended by saying, for Milton, there is a principle inside the regenerated heart that stands and yet moves inwardly to the rhythms of God's love. And I just wanted to uh, put in that last line from the sonnet um, about Milton's blindness. They also serve who only stand and wait. So standing is very important as uh, representing that inward principle.